Hello, everybody. My name is Tim. I'm the lead data scientist at a private equity firm called uh, American Securities. That works OK. And today, I'm going to tell you a little story about how we used spatial data in a bidding process to decide to write a billion dollar check. And so if, for those of us that don't know, private equity, the basic business model is we buy private businesses and then we hold them and manage them for three to five years, hopefully, and then sell them at the three to five year mark, hopefully for a profit, right? And so um, one thing that you need to know about how this process works is that when a business is up for sale, usually the owners of the business put it up for sale, there's a very time intensive, very um, competitive bidding process between usually several different groups. A lot of those are private equity firms. So my firm will participate in these bidding processes. And again, it's important to remember that these are very time intensive uh, processes, right? You're trying to learn as much as you can about the operations of a business in as short a time as possible. It's a little bit like that, what was that TV show where they open up the garage and they, um, uh, they auction off all the stuff that's in the garage and you have to kind of, uh, what was that called? Storage wars, something like that? It's a bit like that. So uh, the story goes like this. Uh, a few months ago, my investment team comes to me and they say, Tim, we're thinking about buying this uh, retail chain, which has a whole bunch of stores in this very particular region in the United States. And by the way, all this data is fake. Everything you're going to see here is fake. We're not allowed to really talk about deals, but uh, the story is real. So the, the, the primary question that we needed to answer in order to feel comfortable about buying this business, because you have to believe that the business is going to continue to be profitable, is can we buy this business and build more of the retail stores that it's already built in order to make it more profitable so that we can sell it in three to five years uh, for a profit, which, by the way, I, I realize that a lot of talks here today are by really, really impressive people who are doing great work on optimizing bus routes for children and city planning, and I'm just up here trying to make a buck, so don't hate me for it, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, so we, we're really interested to see, uh, can we continue to build more stores in this particular location, right? And so there's two ways to do that. You can either do it from a white space perspective where you're expanding into new markets where you don't have a current brand presence, and that's sort of a one strategy. And then there's an infill strategy where you create more stores in the market that you're currently operating in, different considerations there. You gotta think about cannibalization and that kind of thing, right? So question one, basically white space. We look at the performance of the businesses over time. Each dot on this graph is one particular store, and then the x-axis is the years since that store has been opened. So over on the right-hand side are all the older stores, and on the left-hand side are all the newer stores. And this chain has been around for a very long time. As you can see, some of them are almost 60 years old. But there was something really interesting and kind of odd about the data when we looked at it in a temporal point of view, right? The newer stores had kind of a step change down in revenues per year compared to the older stores. And especially when you overlay the, the colors on the graph here are different states that this chain had tried to operate in, especially if you look at the yellow ones here, which is a particular state that they had tried to open into, they seem to be doing particularly bad. So the investment team's looking at this and they come to me and they say, Tim, it looks like when the, the newer stores that they've tried to build, um, especially as they've tried to move further away from their core market, they seem to be doing worse. And this is concerning for us because we have to believe that we're gonna be able to build new stores in order to make this profitable. And if we can't, if the brand doesn't translate outside of this very specific market, then we're gonna build new stores, they're not gonna be profitable, we're not gonna make our money, everyone's gonna be really upset. So uh, the challenge was, and indeed when you look at it from a regression standpoint, you know, the state number four that they opened up in was a statistically significantly poor performer, and the year since open had kind of a, 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 a linear positive correlation, so older stories did much better, right? So this certainly seems to hold some water, but we want to know more, right? We want to dig into the data and figure out, you know, can we learn something about these stores that our competitors maybe won't know, right? That'll give us an edge in this bidding process. Um, so to put it in more mathematical terms, the, ba the basic question was, is distance from the core market the key factor which will determine the underperformance of a store, or are there other confounding factors that we're maybe not considering here something that we can learn about the particular markets that they've tried to open into, which have led to lower performing stores. Um, so, what we did was uh, we sourced 500 or so spatial variables, everything from 
demographics, socio-demographics, competitive presence, um, what else do we have here? A lot of different kinds of different uh, demographic variables. MasterCard, credit card transactions data about describing the, 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 the merchant activity in a particular area. 500 different variables. And we match those all to a 10 or 15 minute drive time radius around each one of the stores, right? And aggregate in that way using the isochrone technology. And we just wanted to see, okay, simple correlations, what pops, what, may, what, what correlates with store revenue? And when we looked at that, um, some interesting trends started to pop out, right? We see that uh, there's not a lot of strong correlations, so no magic, no, no silver bullet here to tell us exactly why a store is gonna perform well or not, but there's some very strong negative correlations to things like population density, frequency of card transactions, concentrations of other stores, right? So we took a look at that and we think, hmm, that's interesting. As they expanded, um, they certainly had stores that were in high population density areas before they expanded, and it's interesting that in addition to distance, density also seems to have something, some kind of effect on revenues, right? Um, so it's funny, I, I was just thinking about this backstage. One of our favorite algorithms is CART, and when we combine it with the data that we get from CARTO, which are two similar sounding but completely different things, um, it's actually an incredibly powerful technique. I love CART classification and regression tree, CART. Um, I think it's wonderfully transparent. Um, in, in a lot of cases, it's, it's even more transparent than a linear regression or something, and really easy for it to explain it, um, especially when in these very competitive, fast-paced bidding processes, you can't do anything. I know, I know what the data scientists in the room are thinking. They're like, oh my God, no back propagation? Like, what were you doing? But, um, I think CART is fantastic. It can be both a predictive model and great for sort of describing and explaining characteristics. So my little plug for CART aside, what you can essentially do is define two arbitrary, uh, 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 an arbitrary binary boundary, right? So in this case, you remember this graph, we said that the newer stores were gonna be the zero case and the older stores were gonna be the one case. So what are the characteristics of new stores versus old stores? And when you let CART do its thing, which it kind of splits the data into logical partitions. You can follow the tree down, and you can see that, okay, newer stores, on average, are further away from the car. We already knew that. They've been expanding outwards. But also, two, have no truck parking. That's interesting. So we've seen that revenue correlates negatively with population density and, 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 and merchant frequency transactions, and also no truck parking. Huh, that's really interesting. Um, so let's, oops, let's split it again. This time, uh, ab this time above average performing stores is the one case and below average performing stores is the zero case. And if, again, if we follow the decision tree down to this side, there's something really interesting happened here. The lighter green means that it's less profitable. The blue means it's more profitable. This is like the less profitable side of the tree, but even though the less profitable side of the tree has kind of this bright spot here, which is at more than 125 kilometers from that core market where they're doing well, they still have stores that are performing pretty well, um, and those stores, that what defines those stores is the lot size. So even if you move far away from the core of the market, if your store has a large lot size, you still perform pretty well. Okay, so this is all starting to kind of come together, and what we found is, especially when we ran the cart tree again on just plain revenue, um, the conclusion was, oh, yeah, the conclusion was, um, was this a brand translation issue? No. What happened was, in the past 10 years, it turned out that this store, for some reason, I don't know who made this decision, tried very hard to expand outside of its core markets, but specifically into cities. They were expanding into city centers around the periphery of their core market, and their stores do best when they are on the side of a highway with large trucks base, truckers come in and take a, take a load off, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, this was a, a, a good segmentation of that problem that kind of led us to that conclusion there. So again, um, in a very short amount of time, using nothing but the, uh, the locations of the stores, we were able to bring in 500 variables of spatial data and make this determination in a very short amount of time. Now remember, this is a very competitive bidding process. We are um, competing against maybe 10 other private equity firms, all of whom have the same information we have, and what we were able to do is, and what we're generally able to do using just sort of the locations of different stores, bring in a tremendous amount of information that we now have that our competitors probably don't have. 
if that makes sense. So using spatial data in a context like this can add a competitive edge, can give you a competitive edge in a bidding process like this, right? So question two, real quick to wrap up. The other question was the infill. Uh, can we build more stores in the current market where we're in? Again, using CART, you could definitely use a, a more powerful model in this particular case, but you know, I really like the uh, interpretability of CART. Basically just scored the census tracks around the existing market based on predicted revenue, right? And the R squared was only like a 0.5 or something like that, so nothing crazy. But basically, we were fairly confident that something like 160 census tracks in the existing market could support a $2 million retail a year store or up. So with those two things together, not only did we determine that the brand doesn't have an issue, the issue is the strategy. And we can, you can correct the strategy in terms of how they expand much easier than you can correct the brand. Um, and two, uh, we felt really comfortable that there was ample opportunity within the current existing market to uh, build additional stores. Um, and so just to, just to wrap up here, using spatial data and very simple techniques, right? Like we're not pushing the boundaries here, we're not writing white papers here. We are very quickly um, using spatial data to gain a competitive information edge in these processes, which allow us to push our assumptions a little bit more, write bigger checks, and ultimately win out in some of these bidding processes. And um, so last thing I'll say is uh, we went to go bid on this business, and then somebody else came in and, and, and wrote a check that was way bigger than our check, so, which we were not comfortable with at all. So either those people were very smart or they were suckers, maybe both, not really sure, but uh, we didn't end up winning that one. But um, yeah, basically in conclusion, I would say spatial data can be a very effective way to uh, gain a competitive edge in a very quick manner, um, and also use CART. It's a fantastic algorithm. Thank you.